Tonight I want to bring you to a journey uh, to, to discover uh, four big mysteries, perhaps uh, the biggest mysteries in the universe. We will talk tonight about mysterious forms of matter and energy, and we will talk about places and events in which the known laws of physics quite literally break down. And as we start, I would like to actually start from uh, uh, something that astronaut Charlie Duke said in April 1972. He was um, coming back from a walk on the moon, uh, and uh, you know, he entered the cockpit. Some of the dust uh, that remained stuck to his uh, spacesuit invaded the cockpit and ended up in his nostrils and his mouth. And he said, it tastes like gunpowder. Right? Another astronaut, this is uh, this astronaut, actually Buzz Aldrin, you see Neil Armstrong reflected in his uh, helmet. You know, in case you don't know what the taste of gunpowder is, he offered a, a you know, better comparison. He said that, he, that the moon smells like wet ashes when you pour some water on the fire to extinguish a, a fire. He said, well, that's the, the smell of the moon. Why are we talking about this, about the smell of the moon? because I wanted to invite you to reflect on something that might seem uh, trivial, but is, if you, the more you think about it, the less trivial it, uh, it, it is. And uh, what, my, what I want to um, invite you to consider is that when we think about the universe, when we try to observe and perceive the distant universe, the only sense that we can use is sight. Well, that's... Uh, kind of obvious, you cannot go out and touch or, or lick uh, you know, meteorites and, and galaxies. Uh, you cannot uh, hear the, the sound or smell, uh, the, uh, the, the smell of astrophysical objects because there's no air in, um, between these astrophysical objects and us, so there's no way they could propagate over these very large distances. But the fact that we can see the universe is less obvious, as I was saying, than it might seem. On one hand, it is true that the eyes, are, our eyes, our organs that have evolved over millions of years to analyze the type of light which is more abundant on Earth, which is the light that comes from the sun, and the sun is a star. So in a sense, eyes are organs that are made to see the stars by construction, by, by evolution, they've evolved to see the stars. It's also true that you can imagine many circumstances in which we might have evolved on uh, planets in which the stars might not be visible. Think about hypothetical forms of, lives, uh, of life on, um, on Venus, for example. You know, there's a very thick layer of clouds uh, covering the planet uh, all the time. Uh, there, are, there might be species that evolve on, um, in oceans under a frozen crust that covers the whole, uh, the whole planet. And for those of you uh, who have uh, read, have, you, have anybody of you read uh, the novel Nightfall by Asimov? Well, at least one. It's one of the best <laughs> novels uh, in, uh, in science fiction that I have ever written, in my opinion. And uh, Asimov imagines a world in which uh, a planet, which is surrounded not just by one star, like uh, us with the sun, but many stars. And so it's always, there's always daylight, and, planet, and uh, the, inhabitants, the inhabitants of this planet are not even aware the stars exist. And then I will not ruin, I will not say anything else, but you know, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful novel, so if you have a chance, go out and read it. Now, by observing this, the, the sky, the night nice sky, so we, we are really lucky that we can uh, enjoy uh, the night nice sky uh, every night, basically. Um, it is by observing with a naked eye the night sky that uh, our ancestors have uh, learned to describe the, the universe. They've learned to, to decipher uh, the universe and to, in particular, to describe the laws of gravity. If you think about it, you know, the laws of Kepler and the work of Copernicus and, and so on, uh, it's all work that has been done based on um, observations with a naked eye. Astronomers back in the days, did not have telescopes in their observatories because telescopes had not been observed. Right? So it's, uh, it's through measurements by the naked eye and some other instruments that people could uh, start to understand the universe. 
And then starting from Galileo, we started to build telescopes. And telescopes are sort of you know, big eyes that collect this uh, light that rains from, uh, from the sky. You know, it goes uh, through the lenses and through the mirrors of the telescopes, and it allows us to see very distant objects. So until the 20th century, basically, this is what we, uh, what we had. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, something interesting start, started to happen because we've built instruments to observe the colors of the universe that are invisible to the human eye. And what I mean with that is that, as you know, light is made of uh, waves, electromagnetic waves. We are, with our eyes, can see in this narrow range of wavelengths, which is the visible light, which is exactly where the emission of the sun peaks, right, right in this range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some animals are able to observe infrared and ultraviolet emission, but there's a whole range, a whole spectrum of waves that goes from radio waves with wavelengths that are, you know, tens, hundreds of meters, all the way to the very energetic gamma rays. And the history of astrophysics in the 20th century has been this journey to the discovery of the colors of the universe that are invisible to the human eye. And we built all these beautiful experiments to collect this, uh, this light and analyze this, uh, this light. The universe that we have discovered by means of these, uh, of these experiments turned out to be you know, wild, crazy, inconceivable place. There are things in the universe we could have never dreamt of. And you know, we could speak for you know, hours and days about all the beautiful uh, objects that we discovered. Uh, we, we could uh, speak for, for days about uh, all the beautiful discoveries we made. We understood where the elements that we find inside our bodies and all around us come from. But tonight, I would like to focus on what we do not know yet about the universe, in particular about the biggest mysteries in the universe. In particular, we have discovered that the universe, all astrophysical structures, like our own galaxy, you know, clusters of galaxies, and the whole structure of the universe is uh, supported by an invisible form of matter that we refer to as dark matter, and we don't know what that is. We just don't have a clue. You know, we know that it's not made of, uh, uh, of atoms, but for the rest, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. And I will talk in a, in a few minutes, about, I will tell you a bit more about what we've uh, discovered about dark matter and we, in which direction the research is going. And then we discovered a form of uh, energy, dark energy, that instead of pulling structures together, it just pushes them away and makes the universe accelerate ever faster. So this is a discovery that happened in the 1970s, dark matter. This is a discovery that happened in the 1990s, dark energy. And then I, I was referring to these places and events in the universe where the known laws of physics break down. I was referring in particular to Big Bang, the origin, the very origin of the universe. And I was referring also to black holes. And collectively, we typically refer to these events where the laws of physics break down as the singularities. Some of you may ha might have heard this, uh, uh, this name. Now, the point that I want to make tonight is that all these mysteries, these four mysteries, might seem completely different, but they share something in common. Because the most recent discoveries seem to suggest that all of them arise from the observation of the universe on very large scales, on scales where gravity rules the structure and evolution of the universe, but they seem to sink their roots in the physics of the microcosm, the physics of the infinitely small, you know, in particular in quantum physics. All right? And the specific point that I want to, to try and make tonight is that a new science is emerging now, it's called uh, multi-messenger astronomy, and in particular the astronomy of gravitational waves, that will allow us to establish these connections between the infinitely large and the infinitely small. You know, to tell you the story, I want to start. So this is the, the point where I want to get. I want to show you that 
I want to elaborate on these mysteries. I want to tell you what these mysteries are in some detail. And then I will try to argue that they all have a quantum origin, all right? And try to, to show you how we can hope to establish these connections between infinitely large and infinitely small. What is this new science that will allow us to establish these connections? It's the science of gravitational waves. How many of you have heard about gravitational waves? Many of you, that's amazing, fantastic. So I will not go too much into the details since many of you have heard about that. If you're curious to know more, maybe just ask me some question after, after the talk. For the moment, I will just say this. Gravitational, the first direct detection of uh, gravitational waves happened in 2016, only six years ago, after a search that has lasted for many, many decades, at least since, since started in the 1960s in earnest. But Einstein you know, worked on this for himself for many, for many decades. Actually, the story of gravitational waves have, has enormously confused Einstein. Uh, he, he tried to publish a paper demonstrating that gravitational waves did not exist, all right? But that's another story I will tell you if you're, if you're interested in the, in the later on. Uh, the point I want to make here is that 2016, there was the first discovery. 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to these three gentlemen for the role they played in the direct detection of gravitational waves. What are gravitational waves? I'll say this in a few sentences, but again, if you're, if you're curious to know more, just ask me questions after, after the talk. Many of you are familiar with the idea that was put forward by Einstein. Einstein understood that gravity can be explained in terms of curvature of space-time. What he meant with that is that, you know, since Newton, we are, uh, we are, we, um, we're used to describe space and time as two separate entities, Einstein has put these two entities together in a continuum that is called the space-time, and he understood that through the curvature of, uh, of this space-time, the fact that in presence of a mass, this continuum gets distorted, it's curved by the presence of mass, then uh, you can explain the motion of a planet, for example, or a satellite in the case of the, of the Earth depicted here, as moving in a straight line in a curved space-time. So just like if you throw a marble in a, in a well, in a potential well like this, it would, uh, it would, its, its trajectory would curve. And this, in the same way, a planet or a satellite that would move around the Earth would feel the curvature of space-time and can move in a close orbit around this uh, uh, central object. Now, in the case of gravitational waves, it, the idea is a, a, sort of, a sort of a generalization of this concept. This is a stationary situation. Well, it can be made dynamic by adding an object that rotates around this uh, central object without perturbing the curvature of this metric. But what if you have two very massive objects that move very fast in this sort of elastic uh, continuum that is, uh, is space-time? Well, this rapid motion would cause ripples to form on, on space-time. And these ripples will propagate away from the event that has produced them. And we can build now instruments that collect these, uh, um, these that feel this uh, train of waves that is coming towards us. Why is this all important? If we go back to this analogy, I told you that humanity had since you know, forever, basically only one sense to perceive the universe. It had eyes, our eyes, and we saw how in the 20th century we've uh, increased uh, the, the, number, the, the colors that we could perceive thanks to these uh, instruments, but always using electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves. Now we have something else that we can use to perceive the universe. It's as if we collectively, as, as humans, had developed a new sense to perceive events in the universe that would otherwise remain buried in darkness forever out of our grasp, all right? And this is, this is really amazing and, and beautiful, I think. Okay, so I want to move on now to describe in, a, in some detail these mysteries that I've briefly mentioned, dark matter, dark energy, the Big Bang, and, uh, and black holes. In order to organize uh, the discussion, I thought it would be useful to 
go back to a depiction of the cosmos that was uh, familiar for generations of, uh, of humans, uh, basically all the way through the Middle Ages, and also, and also you know, to many today as we study the astronomy of the, of the past. Now, already the ancient Greeks, but then you know, this, this view was elabor further elaborated in the, in the Middle Ages, they had this idea of you know, placing the Earth at the center of the, of the universe, uh, this was a, you know, an ultra-naive depiction of the universe, but it was a, an effort really to organize all the information that we had about uh, the, the universe in a, class, in, a coherent, in a coherent system. So the Earth was at the center, and then there were nine spheres, nine celestial spheres. These nine spheres were associated, you know, five of them, to the five inner planets of the solar system, so Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, five, and then two spheres were associated to the sun and the moon. We were at seven. And then there was sphere number eight. There was fixed stars. And then sphere number eight, so, sorry, sphere number nine was associated to the so-called primum mobile. There was this external sphere from which all the movements of, um, of the other spheres uh, followed. Now, today it wouldn't make any sense to associate one sphere to every celestial object that we have discovered, because we've discovered so many, they would be completely pointless. What we can do, though, is uh, a sort of a mental exercise, and we will do the following. We will work with nine spheres, but instead of associating an object to each sphere, we will associate a, an actual physical sphere of increasing radius. And the only trick that we will play is that Instead of uh, you know, the second sphere being uh, twice the size of the, of the first one, it will be 1,000 times larger. And then the third sphere, 1 million larger, and so on. And we will see where do we get with, uh, with this. So sphere one is easy. You, know, it's, it's, you take a sphere basically centered around the Earth that contains everything that we see around us between 1 meter and 1,000 meters on the surface of the Earth. So that's us, basically, right? You know, all the stuff we are, we are familiar with. 90% of the uh, human population lives at an altitude uh, smaller than 1,000 meters. So, of course, there are people who live in uh, high peaks and, and so on. But, you know, this is the, the sphere we are most familiar with, of course. And this actually might be, it, if, you, if you think about it, the only place in the universe where life as we know it is supported. There might be other places, but for the moment, this is the only place we know where life is, uh, is possible in the universe. So this is you know, something we should always keep in mind. Let's increase now, and let's consider a sphere that, let's, let's look at a sphere that contains everything up to 1 million meters, 1,000 kilometers. We could call this the sphere of, sorry, the sphere of air, because it contains all the atmosphere of the Earth, and so all the air that we, that we breathe. It also includes many artificial satellites, and in particular, you're, many of you are familiar with this, the International Space Station, which you know, revolves around the Earth in around 90 minutes at an altitude of around 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So far, so good. We are, this is all familiar. We go up to sphere three. We include the orbit of the moon. And I've depicted it here. But of course, these are not the real proportions of the Earth and the Moon. If you look at the real proportions, this is the Earth, and this is the Moon. You know, many of you probably don't, don't even see it, right? So the universe, the universe really is, is empty, you know, right? You know, if, if, if you, the more you zoom out, the more you realize that it's uh, the universe, the density of the universe is really, really very low. And, uh, and it's, it's almost, we're, we're really embedded in a, in a sea of darkness in a certain sense. Go up to sphere four, the landscape becomes less familiar, but not so much. You start to include all the, the inner planets of the, of the solar system, all the orbits out to the orbits of Jupiter, more or less. And you include the sun, and so let's call this sphere the sphere of the sun. And then let's make one additional jump to sphere five. You see now why we decided to work with uh, spheres one to nine. Because if, you if I told you that this is uh, 1,000 
you know, what is it, one million billion meters probably wouldn't be very, very useful for anyone. But anyway, so right here we are including every, all the planets of the solar system. We also include in, somebody knows what this is? Voyager 2. We include Voyager 2, which is the most distant ob man-made object, human-made object, uh, that, was, uh, um, that, we, that we launched uh, several decades ago now. And it's, uh, it's out here, and it's included in this, uh, in this sphere 5. We do another jump, and now the landscape changes completely. Because in this sphere, we just multiply times another factor of 1,000, but now we are in a field of stars. We're including around 5,000 stars in this uh, sphere. Around these stars, uh, probably around each of these stars, there are planets. How do we know? Because, you know, we've observed so many. Does anybody know how many planets we've observed so far? Right? Well, I haven't checked, the, you know, the latest counting, but, you know, we are certainly beyond 4,000 planets around other stars other than the sun. All right? So basically everywhere we look, every, we, we, where we can look accurately, we see that there are, there are planets, and it's a good assumption that around each of these stars there will be, there will be planets. Among these stars, there also will be, and we come to the first mystery that I told you I would uh, talk about, there are black holes. You know, black holes are the end point of the life of many stars, you know, especially massive stars. And now, not only we have uh, the theoretical tools to describe them, in the 19, end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, John Wheeler, the, the physicist John Wheeler, described the um, black holes as uh, pure gravitational aura, right? There's, there's nothing, uh, there's, there's only the pool of gravity that remains from out, out of the collapse of a star. It basically implodes, all its mass collapses, it's not supported anymore by the pressure uh, that, is, uh, that is produced by nuclear reactions, it's not supported also by the other exotic things that can happen in stars, like the so-called degeneracy pressure that happens in the case of, of uh, you know, quantum, um, a quantum state of matter. Nothing can support the collapse of the star, so the star collapses on itself, and then, you know, in principle, it collapses to a point with, uh, with zero dimension, with infinite density, right? So whenever we hear zero and infinite in physics, we become very skeptical. You know, we know that something is, uh, something is wrong. One could tell the story of theoretical physics as a, you know, basically a, a war against, uh, against infinities, and every time we fight, against an infinity, we discover something new. But anyway, going back to, going back to black holes, I'm sure you've, you've all seen this, uh, this image here. It was on the front page of you know, all newspapers and all uh, media outlets in the world. We can now create images of, uh, of black holes. We can see the ring of gas, very hot gas, that swirls around black holes. And then we see the shadow of the black hole sitting at the center. And by measuring the size of the shadow, we can actually uh, confirm Einstein's theory of general relativity. You know, a small parenthesis, people like to say whenever these results are, are published, you know, whenever we talk about gravitational waves and, and black holes, uh, people like to say Einstein was right. right? You, you might have seen, heard this uh, over and over uh, if, you're, if you followed science news. But the funny thing is that Einstein didn't believe that gravitational waves, no black holes, uh, could exist. He was very, very skeptical, and actually, he actually tried to prove that, in principle, they could not exist. So it wasn't actually Einstein who was, uh, who was always right. It was his theory, general relativity, the theory he discovered in, uh, it was in 1915, uh, that, uh, that was, always, was always right. You know, it, and so far, it always turned out to be, to be right. Now, I told you that for all of these um, mysteries, I wanted to establish this connection between the infinitely large and the infinitely small. Why the infinitely large meets the infinitely small around the black hole? Well, this connection 
was uh, already discussed by Stephen Hawking, one of the most uh, famous scientists uh, of the, uh, well, they died only a few, on, a few years ago. And uh, through a series of uh, theoretical studies, he made some very important discoveries about black holes. And in particular, he discovered the process that goes under the name of black hole evaporation. And put it simply, if you have quantum fields around black holes, these quantum entities in the universe, and they're present around black holes, then this process can happen that by, by which some of the mass of the black hole is extracted from the black hole itself, and the, the black hole can, can shrink and slowly reduce its mass and then vanish and disappear. All right? This process is extremely slow for astrophysical black holes, but is in principle, uh, in principle uh, there for us to, to measure. And then uh, Stephen Hawking started to ask uh, some very deep uh, and profound questions about um, the, what happens to information, for example, as you throw something into, into a black hole. So whatever, you know, the, the, many of the laws of, uh, of physics can be described in terms of, uh, of information. But without getting too much technical here, think about the following. You know, in quantum physics, whenever there is a, a process uh, that, that you want to, to describe, information is always conserved. In this process here, information that is falls into the black hole, so when quantum physics meets general relativity, well, we don't know what happens to this information. It is possible that this information, you know, at least if you look at it naively, disappears completely, you know, in the depths of, uh, of the black hole, and then gets radiated away in the form of radiation. But many people have, uh, have followed, have worked on that, and they started to ask very, again, deep questions. Is this information stored somewhere inside the black hole, on the surface of the black hole? Is it radiated away with this radiation that is produced when the black hole shrinks? So this has opened really a, a, a new discipline uh, in, um, in physics, and black holes these days are laboratories for theoretical physics. If you walk, if you come to, to Science Park, you will see many people discussing on blackboards, discussing precisely this issue, discussing about how to use these black holes as laboratories for new physics. You might have heard also about uh, uh, a, um, a recent discovery that was made, you know, trying to explore these uh, correspondence and analogies between quantum physics and general relativity. Okay, so first mystery that we encountered, black holes, and this connection that goes through basically the discoveries of, uh, uh, of Stephen Hawking and the possibility of getting something interesting out of this connection between quantum gravity and general relativity. Let's go up uh, by one sphere. The black hole, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's wonderful. All right, so cheers, everyone. All right, so let's go up by one sphere. And let's move to sphere number seven. Now, this is also another pretty spectacular jump because we went from our field of stars, of like 5,000 stars, to include 100 billion stars in the gas. <laughs> I like that enthusiasm, I like, I like that energy. These are the stars in the Milky Way, in our own galaxy, all right? So this is not an image of the Milky Way because we, are, we live inside the Milky Way, so we cannot take a photograph of our own galaxy. But this is an image of our sister galaxy, the, ga the Andromeda galaxy, uh, M31. This is one of the, maybe the only extra galactic object that you can observe with the naked eye from our hemisphere. Okay, so if you, if you look at it through a binocular or through a, a telescope, it appears to you know, in, all its, uh, in, in all its glory, it's beautiful galaxy, spiral galaxy, uh, with more or less the same mass and shape that our own uh, Milky Way galaxy. Now, on this scale, something 
you know, well, this is my favorite mystery, and actually I, I work on, uh, on this. And, uh, but I'll try to, uh, to, to, not to talk too much about, about this. I'll just give you the, the gist of, the, uh, of this beautiful mystery. And then if you have further questions, uh, feel free to ask them after, after the talk. Now, the point I want to make is the following. If you ask until very recently, until the 1970s or 80s, to an astronomer, if you ask uh, what is a galaxy, he, would have shown, he or she would have shown you an image like this one. All right, again, M31, a disk of gas and stars orbiting around a common center. If you ask today to a cosmologist, what is a galaxy, we show, we show you a different picture. There is indeed a disk of gas and stars, but this disk of gas and stars is embedded in a much larger halo of dark matter. All right? And this dark matter that you see depicted here is the distribution of dark matter uh, that comes out from a numerical simulation, right? So if you ask, if you put it in, in a computer all the initial conditions of the universe and you say, you know, ask the computer to produce a universe as we, as we observe it in presence of dark matter, we show you that dark matter is distributed like this, and all the baryons, all the normal matter, the, the matter made of atoms that you and I and everything around us is made of, sinks at the bottom of this huge potential well produced by dark matter and sits right here, right at the center. If you remove all of this around, uh, around the, the disk of stars and gas, all this galaxy, all these stars will basically fly away like bullets in, uh, in the intergalactic space, right? So it's th this thanks to the gravitational pull provided by this distribution of dark matter, the galaxies are bound together and we observe them as, as they are. You know, this conclusion was, this result was found, or well, let's say a conclusive um, evidence for the existence of dark matter was obtained in the 19th 70s, and it seemed uh, absurd, right? You know, this amount of matter is around maybe six times larger than the amount of matter in the, in the stars and in the disk of a galaxy, and is invisible. You know, who would believe that, right? You know, there's no way this can be this can be true, and yet every observation we have performed since the 1980s, and we have many and many independent observations of, you know, observations of how fast stars and gas rotate around galaxies, how fast galaxies move inside clusters of galaxies, even completely different observations on the scale of, on cosmological scales, we will come later to that, they all seem to point to the same conclusion. There is a form of matter which is not in the form of atoms, nothing like the matter we are familiar with, and is six times more abundant than the uh, matter in the universe. So this, of course, has triggered an enormous interest uh, in, uh, in the community, and it was believed, you know, when I've, so I started doing science in the new millennium. Uh, I started my PhD in, uh, in, in the year 2000, like 22 years ago. And when I started this, uh, this, uh, to work in this uh, field of research, everybody was excited about, about that. We, it seemed that the solution to this problem was around the corner, and uh, well, let me skip this one. There was uh, a huge uh, theoretical effort uh, that went into the, uh, the identification of dark matter. This is a mind map that we put together a few years ago with a colleague uh, at, the, at the University of Irvine to try and organize all the theoretical work that has been done uh, towards the identification of dark matter. I will not walk you, walk you through all these possibilities. Let me just mention one thing. Let's focus on these big blobs only. This one, one, two, three, and four, deal with dark matter in the form of new particles, new elementary particles. Okay, they can they have some very exotic names, you know, axions and uh, supersymmetric particles and little Higgs and, and so on and so forth, when bazillas and so on. But the details are not important. The idea was that you can come up with uh, explanations for dark matter 
that are theoretically very well motivated. And all of these, especially these three blobs, concern candidates for dark matter that have been um, uh, proposed by, by uh, particle physicists who were not trying to solve the dark matter problem. They were working on completely different problems. And you know, through the solutions they proposed for those other problems, as a bonus, they predicted the existence of particles that had the right properties to explain dark matter. So they were, we refer to these candidates as natural candidates as opposed to ad hoc candidates. So candidates that have been proposed specifically to solve the dark matter problem. Another possibility is that dark matter is made of uh, macroscopic, instead of particles, is made of macroscopic objects like planets or dwarf stars or things that we cannot see with our telescopes. This has long been ruled out in the case of uh, planets and dwarf galaxies. But one possibility remains. It has to do with uh, another discovery of uh, Stephen Hawking, actually, the idea that black holes might have formed in the early universe. And this possibility remains open. Actually, it's attracting a lot of interest. And finally, I must uh, mention an additional possibility. All the uh, evidence we have for dark matter relies on the assumption that we understand gravity on very large scales. All right? So this statement is, if we try to explain the observations of the universe with our theory of gravity, general relativity in particular, the Einstein's theory of general relativity, if we stick to general relativity, then the standard model, the particles that are described in the textbooks of particle physics are not enough to explain what's out there. Right? So one possibility is to say, well, of course, we, because we haven't discovered other particles, the other particles that are out there, and most of the community believes that this is the wise explanation. Um, another possibility that we, uh, that we have to take into account and that we cannot rule out until we find these particles in our laboratories is that there's something wrong with our theory of gravity. Right? And there's a fraction of the, a portion, a minority of scientists in the community who are working very hard to see whether they can reconcile the observations, the, the predictions with the observations by modifying the theory of gravity instead of adding new particles to the universe. Okay? So I told you that I wanted to, uh, for each of these mysteries, I wanted to explain how the new, um, uh, this new astronomy of gravitational waves might help us establishing these big connections. Suppose that dark matter is made of particles, right? And then consider the collision between two black holes surrounded by dark matter particles. Now, if there is no dark matter around, uh, so dark matter is shown with these, um, with these blue dots around, uh, around the, the two black holes. Suppose that there is no dark matter around these black holes. We know how to compute the merger of these two black holes with an amazing precision. We can calculate the waveform of the merger, so the type of gravitation, the modulation of the gravitational waves produced by the merger of these two black holes with fantastic accuracy. And the, the, the waves that we measure with our interferometers actually match perfectly with the theoretical prediction. What if dark matter is in the form of particles and these particles are um, surround these, uh, these two black holes. Well, if you follow the merger in presence of dark matter, something interesting happens. Now, these two black holes are getting closer and closer to each other. Let's zoom in. And what you see is that the black hole that arrived here and that we trace with this white line is not going back to its uh, natural orbit, the orbit that it would have in absence of dark matter, but some of its energy, its, some of the energy of the binary is transferred to the distribution of dark matter particles. So by looking at the waveform of the merger of black holes, we can discover whether dark matter particles have accreted around these black holes. And by looking very carefully at the waveform, at the modulation of the gravitational waves emitted by these mergers, we can even say something about the nature of these particles. Okay, so this is one explicit example of how we can use these, uh, uh, this new astronomy 
to connect this uh, infinitely large and infinitely small. We're only two spheres away from the end of our journey. Let's move to sphere number eight. Now, this is really very unfamiliar territory. What you see here is the so-called cosmic web. When you go on scales much larger than the size of our own galaxy, you discover the filaments and voids uh, that exist in the universe that are formed by the evolution of, uh, of the universe from an initial hom almost completely homogeneous state to the variety of galaxies and stars and clusters of galaxies that we observe in the universe. We can, this is the result of a numerical simulation. This is actually the same numerical simulation that you saw in the, in the uh, title slide running. And uh, by observing the universe on these uh, large scales, on the scales of the cosmic web, this pretty incredible discovery was, uh, was made in the 1990s. What people obs observed was that, that we knew that the universe was expanding. We've known this for already for 100 years, since the pioneering work of uh, Hubble in the 1920s. We knew that the universe, we know that the universe is expanding. What these people, uh, the people performing these measurements were trying to measure was uh, how fast this expansion was uh, slowing down. Because you know, if you have something that expands, you know, people thought you know, maybe it will expand, maybe it will stop expanding, and then it will recollapse again. We would have a sort of a bouncing universe, right? You know, expanding and then contracting in cycles. Now, this, one, this was one of the preferred solutions for many people to understand what is the, you know, why the universe is in this particular, we observe in this particular state, but we're just capturing the state, a particular state of the universe, in one of these many cycles of expansion and, and contraction. But instead of finding this slow down in the expansion, these, these uh, you know, two separate teams of astronomers discovered that the universe is expanding ever faster. So the rate of expansion of the universe has increased in the recent past of the universe. And I was a bit harsh with, with Einstein when I said that he was always wrong uh, when, when talking about black holes and gravitational waves. You know, the thing about geniuses like, like Einstein is that even their mistakes were the work of a genius, right? And uh, in particular, Einstein, when he wrote the equations for, when he applied his own theory of general relativity to the universe as a whole, to describe the universe as a whole, he found actually that the universe was expanding or contracting, right? You know, it had to be in a dynamical, in a dynamical state. But when he made this discovery, Hubble hadn't discovered yet the expansion of the universe. So Einstein wanted a universe that was static, that was not moving. So what he said, he said, well, let me do the following. Let me take my beautiful equations that I just arrived and let me put a patch on it. You know, and you know, put a cosmological constant, he called it uh, back then, a term in his equations that, in his opinion, would be sufficient to prevent the universe from expanding or contracting. This turned out to be a mistake for two reasons, because it's not true that this term actually uh, stabilizes the universe, so this, this would, not, would not have been a solution anyway, and also because the universe is not static, as Einstein believed, and only a few years later, it was discovered that it was, that it was expanding. But then in the 1990s, when people made this discovery, they, they realized that that particular patch that Einstein had put to his, uh, onto, in, into his uh, equations is actually perfectly consistent with these type of observations. So this, uh, uh, the, the cosmological constant was... Uh, uh, recollected from the dustbin of the, uh, of the wrong theories, and then uh, it was shown to explain perfectly the data that we have uh, for dark energy. Now, what is dark energy? First of all, let me say that if you describe the amount of mass and energy that we have in the universe, most of the universe, most of the energy budget in the universe is, on this, is in the form of dark energy. A fraction a smaller fraction is in the form of dark matter, and only 5% of it is in the form of atoms. All the observations we have in the universe are consistent with this picture. 
When people say that 95% of the universe is dark, though, one has to be very careful because this can be really, really misleading. And the reason why is the, is the following. If you take a sphere, if you draw a sphere, like you know, sphere one or sphere two or sphere three that we described in our uh, description of the universe in, in, in the form of celestial spheres, and you ask the question, what is the universe made of in those spheres, the small scale spheres, everything is made of atoms, right? If you increase the size of this sphere, if you include the size of the whole galaxy, then you pick up the contribution to this mass and density and, density and energy budget that comes from the older dark matter surrounding these galaxies. And then you see that this proportion between dark matter and atoms is, you know, almost reaches this one to six uh, ratio that I discussed. It's always, only when you go on very, very, very large scales, on scales larger than classes of galaxies, big agglomerates of galaxies, that you recover this um, proportion between dark matter, dark energy, and atoms. Okay? So keep that in mind. You know, this is a statement that applies only on very large scales in the universe. So if you're interested in how fast the universe is expanding, this is what you have to, to use. And to, and to keep in mind, if you're interested in understanding the structure of a galaxy, this doesn't tell you anything about the structure of the galaxy. On the scale of a galaxy, everything is dominated by dark matter. And the other point I want to make is that it's also a time-dependent statement. If you look at the universe, I'll go very quickly on this because it's a bit, it's a bit uh, technical. But the point I want to make is, if you go back in the history of the universe, the matter and energy in the universe was in the form of mostly photons, so lights, and neutrinos, some ultralight particles in the standard model, for those of you who are not familiar with it. So relativistic particles. So these are all particles of the standard model. And dark matter and uh, matter, you know, in the form of atoms, and also dark energy, had, you know, played a very completely negligible role in the evolution of the universe. Dark matter started to dominate at, you know, when structures started to form in the universe. And then today, we have this relative proportion between dark matter, dark energy, and atoms. If you go in the distant future, then dark energy will actually completely dominate the matter and energy budget of the universe. So there's nothing fundamental really about this uh, statement that 95% of the universe is dark. It's just a statement about the content of the universe in this particular epoch of, epoch of its uh, evolution and on very large scales. What is dark energy? There are many ideas out there. The data are not conclusive enough to understand what dark energy might be. It is possible that this is the energy associated to the quantum vacuum, that differently from the classical vacuum, contains energy. It might be a manifestation of a particular exotic form of energy, a so-called quantum field, or it might be a geometric property of space-time, like a sort of uh, elasticity of, uh, of our, of our space-time. And again, also here, measuring the expansion rate of the universe with gravitational waves could help us solve this mystery. You know, gravitational waves provide us a, an independent way of measuring the expansion rate of the universe, and it might help us understanding which among the different hypotheses that have been put forward is the correct one. You know, we're getting towards the end of our journey. This is the last, uh, the last sphere. Once we increase by another factor of 1,000 the size of this sphere, we arrive to encompass the whole size of the observable universe. Okay, this is not the size of the universe. We don't know what the size of the universe is. But we know what is the size of the universe that we can observe. All right? And from the edge of this uh, observable universe, we see this emission. This emission comes from regions that are so far away from us that it took them the age of the universe to get to us. Okay, so light propagates at a finite speed. If you look, 
If you look at the sun, you see how it was eight minutes ago. If you look at the Andromeda galaxy, you see how it was a few millions, years, uh, millions of years ago. If you look all the way to the size of the <coughs> observable universe, <coughs> you see the universe, how it was, very shortly after the Big Bang. And this is, in my opinion, one of the most amazing images. This is not a simulation. These are actual data. This is light that comes from the early universe, when the universe was only 400,000 years ago. Right? It is four, 14 billion years, uh, years of age now. So this is the equivalent of a, a newborn, uh, of a newborn universe, right? And what you see here are these small inhomogeneities that were present in the early universe. In order to pick up these inhomogeneities, you have to increase the contrast in this image enormously. These are fluctuations in the density of the universe that are at the level of one part in 100,000. You know the. The universe was really very, very, very uniform uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The homogeneities were actually, the homogeneities in the air of this room are actually larger than uh, the homogeneities that were present here in this, uh, in this image. But this is an image, even if it's almost perfectly constant, the density in the, in the universe, the fact that there are these inhomogeneities is incredibly important. We can study statistically these inhomogeneities, the pattern in these inhomogeneities, and we learn a lot about the state of the universe, so much that if we take this image and we calculate what was the, st the, the state of the universe 400,000 years ago, and we take these conditions and we fit them to a computer, and then we ask, is this, what is the universe that would come out from, of these initial conditions if we wait 14 million, uh, sorry, 14 billion years? The computer does this. You know, this is the time elapsed since the Big Bang in billions of years. The universe starts from a configuration in which, it, where it is almost uh, uniformly, with an almost uniform density. And then you start to form under the pool of gravity, you start to form these uh, filaments and these voids surrounding these, uh, these filaments, this cosmic web. And if you follow these uh, structures, so what you see here is mainly the so-called dark ages of the, of the universe. This is mostly dark matter. But if you follow one of these structures here, you see that a few billions of years after the Big Bang, something interesting started to happen. At the center of these, uh, of these filaments, where filaments meet, because stars start to form, gas becomes so dense that it fragments into stars. Gas, so this gas collapses under its weight until the density becomes so large that it powers nuclear reactions. And this nuclear reaction counterbalance the effect of gravity, and you have stars. You know, stars are really nuclear reactors in space, right? That are transforming all these elements that were present in the early universe, you know, hydrogen and helium, into the elements that we see around us. And we can do amazing things with, this, uh, with these simulations. We can compute you know, the, the quantity of various type of elements uh, that are formed in the universe. We can calculate what is the statistical distribution of galaxies in the sky. And all of this, and remember, we just started from the initial conditions imparted, imprinted on the CMB, we let the computer evolve in presence of dark matter and, energy, and dark energy to evolve a universe. And the universe we get out of these simulations is, corresponds very, very well to the universe uh, we observe with our telescopes. Now, of course, you know, the big question is, where do these fluctuations that we see imprinted on the CMB come from? And this is the last point I want to make. So we say the, we, we, we change the problem of figuring out what's out there in the universe to understanding where those initial conditions that we see imprinted on the CMB come from. Because if we understand that, we know how to form a universe.
But then we ask in the question, the next question, which is, where do these fluctuations come from? There's a beautiful theory that has been put forward in the 1980s that goes under the name of uh, uh, the theory of inflation. And according to this theory, in the early universe, we had some form of repulsive gravity, so to say, in a quantum field that behaves with certain properties. And because of these, of the presence of, and the properties of these particular fields, the universe expanded very, very fast. You know, it's something equivalent to what's happening today in presence of dark energy, but on a scale completely different because what was happening back then is that you were taking something that was microscopic, you know, something much, much, much smaller than the size of an atom, and then you were enlarging this at furious pace until you reached macroscopic, uh, macroscopic sizes. And then once you reached these macroscopic sizes, this quantum field decayed, and in the decay of these quantum fields, you know, you have basically the production of all the matter uh, uh, that we observe in the universe. And according to this theory, what we see imprinted here are the small differences in the decay rates of this, uh, of this quantum field, the, the moment at which this quantum field has decayed in different regions of time. I know it's, it's uh, a lot to digest in one slide, but the important point that we'd like you to take away is that we have a theory to explain this pattern of inhomogeneities. This theory goes under the name of the theory of inflation, and it makes a prediction, at least in a portion of the, of the parameter space, that if this theory is true, we should be able to see gravitational waves produced by this process. Okay, so the details are complicated, but the key point is there's a theory that explains the data and makes a prediction that we can test with our experiments, with our gravitational wave experiments, okay? And if we figure this out, sorry if I don't destroy anything, if, I, if we figure this out, then we have really pushed uh, our understanding of the universe to a tiny, tiny fraction after the Big Bang to an epoch which is 10 to the minus 32, 10 to the minus 33 seconds after the Big Bang. Okay, so this is what we've uh, put together in this, uh, in this journey. Let me just mention this. Um, we could do the same, but this is for another time. We could do the same, you know, we looked at very large scales in the universe. We could do the same looking at very small scales in the universe. And I'll put a reference later on for those who want to, to know more. And let me uh, finish with this. Uh, we described nine circles of heaven. We talked about four cosmic mysteries. Uh, we talked about two infinities, you know, the infinitely large and, two, and infinitely small, and one new science to connect them. At the center of all of this, there's us, you know, us human beings. You know, there's a lot that could be said about the implications, even the philosophical implications about all of this. But let me leave you with, uh, with this thought. Um, we, we've known for a long time now, for several decades, that we stardust in the sense that, you know, all the elements that make our bodies are uh, produced in interiors of stars, you know, through these uh, generations of stars that transform the hydrogen and the helium that was present already after the Big Bang into heavier and heavier elements. With these new theories, so, we, so this is what connects us to the infinitely large, what these new theories are doing is that we are, it seems that we are intimately connected also to the physics of the infinitely small. So as we are stardust, we could also say that in a sense, we also quantum ash, you know, the, the ash of these processes that happen shortly after the Big Bang. And with this thought, maybe I will uh, conclude it here. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your attention.